Hello and welcome to this talk. Now in this video we're going to be looking at withdrawal of pharmaceutical products and we're going to look at various pharmaceutical products that have been withdrawn over the past decades and compare that to the current situation and we'll see that there's marked differences between the two. Now this is based on this paper here, Pharmaceutical Product Recall an educated hesitancy towards new drugs and novel vaccines, and it's by Dr. Peter Rhodes and Dr. Peter Parry. Now, uh, Dr. Parry, uh, I've had the privilege of talking to in the UK and in Australia, and uh, he's, an, uh, he's a psychiatrist, and Dr. Rhodes is uh, an anaesthetist and intensivist, so both practicing clinicians. Now, just to see if you want to watch this, let me just give you an inkling of what this video is going to be about. So here we have reported deaths by year, COVID-19 vaccines versus all other vaccines. So here we have the years 1990, 1991 along the bottom there. And uh, the yellow is tragically the number of deaths that have occurred in the United States after vaccination reported on the VERS uh, Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. And we see that the numbers are not good by any means, but relatively low and all of a sudden with the covid vaccines we get this huge increase so low where well, there's massive increase here in 2021 up to 26850 2022 down to 8380 uh, further down thankfully in 2023 but if you can compare these low figures here to these massively high figures here it really makes you realise the change in, in pretty well an order of magnitude of what's going on uh, in terms of adverse reactions. Now, this data here also from the paper is from Australia. Now, this shows uh, estimated mortality by detailed age band for particular years. And particularly here, if we look at this worst one here where there's a doubling, this is the 35 to 44 year old age range. And it's in the uh, quarter three, the third quarter of 2021. So we see that, OK, that slightly higher mortality than we would expect, but, but very much higher here after the vaccine rollouts. That's telling you there's a temporal correlation. Nothing more. There's a temporal correlation there. Uh, which should be uh, taken on board and explained. So that's discussed in the paper. Now, this is particularly interesting. This is reported deaths of major drug vaccine recalls. So these are all drugs and vaccines that have been recalled in the past. So here, for example, we see polio vaccine uh, cutter incident of uh, 1955 resulting in 10 deaths, not going to go into the detail. Swine flu vaccine, 1976, um, reported deaths uh, for major drug vaccine recalls that caused the recall. So here we see 10 deaths, 53 deaths, uh, 94 deaths. Uh, now, there was a bad one here, uh, Vioxx, which we're going to look at, 6,639 deaths before recall. But normally, if we look at these other things, Resulin, for example, recording uh, the year 2000, 649 deaths, and it was recalled. So here we've got recalls after tens of deaths or, or hundreds of deaths, or in this case, a few thousand deaths. Uh, COVID-19 vaccines, two years on the go and yet to be recalled, 37,544 reported deaths from the uh, Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, and this, the, um, the FARS, that's the FDA uh, Adverse Events reporting system so we see this huge discrepancy these were all recalled after in that case 214 deaths this was recalled very badly late after 6693 it was probably more actually but then we see 37,544 for the uh, the covid-19 vaccines it seems they seem to be being judged by two completely different parameters it really is quite strange and then this graphic here, this is suspected deaths per million doses of vaccine. So the red um, is, uh, is deaths uh, per million doses in red. 
and the blue is the doses in millions actually given. So for example, here we see influenza during this time period. So th this is the traditional vaccines here. It's going from uh, 2006 to 2021. During that time, uh, there's been doses of uh, vaccine given. So we see 28 million doses of vaccine given there for influenza. Uh, but then we look at the, um, the deaths per million here and we see it's 0 0.27 deaths. So 0 0.27 deaths for every million doses of influenza vaccine given. And here we see other vaccines along the bottom here. If we just stick to looking at the, the red, we're looking at the deaths per million uh, doses of vaccine. Uh, so hepatitis B, for example, 3.13 uh, deaths per million doses of vaccine. But then when we go into the COVID vaccines, yes, there's a lot given in blue, but look at the death rate between 18.45 and 26.85 deaths per million doses. Now, the discrepancy here is that um, it depends if you count vaccines distributed or vaccines actually given. Because towards the end, when people were starting to realise about these adverse reactions, a lot of vaccines were distributed, but nothing like as many were given. But again, if we just look at this as in very simple terms, death per million vaccines, uh, relatively low for most of the traditional vaccines, very low for influenza, not a lot of vaccines given, but very low number of deaths per million. But the COVID vaccines, very high numbers of deaths per million doses of vaccine given. And I'm afraid it's even worse when we look at the uh, the age here. So here we have, um, what we have here in red is, is adverse events, the numbers of adverse events um, for particular age groups below 2, 2 to 4, 5 to 11. But in blue here, we've got uh, adverse events per million uh, vaccinated, one or more vaccine doses. So we see that the, um, the number of... Uh, adverse events reported per million doses of vaccine given is very high in the younger age groups. So that really makes you wonder why we're giving vaccines to people under children below the age of two uh, when there's 4,643 4, adverse events reported per million doses of vaccine. Relatively safer in older people but still completely unacceptable levels of, uh, of adverse reactions. So that's just a few uh, appetizers of what's uh, going to be in this video. Let's look at the abstract of the paper now. Um, pharmaceutical products recall and educated hesitancy towards new drugs and novel vaccines. And it's a bit of historical review. And they open it by saying this. That's the link, by the way. Download it for yourself. Very readable, actually. Um, uh, very comprehensive. Um, it's a bit of a textbook, this, to be quite honest. Huge piece of work for the two doctors concerned. Huge piece of work and a very thorough piece of work. Um, but uh, takes quite a bit of reading, but it's highly intelligible. It's not in technical medical language. So you could download it yourself and you could read through it really quite carefully in, in about an hour and a half, a couple of hours. Well worth doing if you, if you have the time. So pharmaceutical product recall and, and educated hesitancy. Now, educated hesitancy here means educated hesitancy is not saying, oh, I don't want that. It's saying, in this case, you know, I'm not really sure I want an mRNA vaccine because it's in a lipid nanoparticle, which do have a level of intrinsic toxicity. As well as that, we know it's going to be systemically distributed. That means it's going to be delivering genetic material potentially to any cell in the body, meaning any cell in the body could be producing this foreign protein, which would be expressed onto the surface of its cell, recognised by the immune system, and the immune system would then destroy the cell um, expressing the foreign protein. That would be an educated hesitancy. It's not saying, oh, I don't like needles, or I think this is a bad idea. It's giving very precise reasons as to why it's a bad idea. And of course, it's also giving another very precise reason is data just like this, which shows the massive increase in reported deaths by year uh, when the COVID vaccines were rolled out compared to all other vaccines. So that to me is not unreasonable hesitancy. It's educated hesitancy. So that's what this is talking about. And they say of the many pharmaceutical products launched for the benefit of humanity, and we agree, 
they, 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 these, are, these are doctors, for goodness sake. They're not anti-medicine. <laughs> Uh, a significant number have had to be recalled from the marketplace due to adverse events. So, yeah, drugs are great. Giving the drug for the right indication is totally wonderful. Drugs are brilliant. You give them out every day at work for huge amounts. Uh, and, uh, of course, ethically, you only give it if you're completely happy with it. You know, one of the most satisfying jobs you can ever do in clinical practice is to give someone intravenous morphine. And you can just see the pain draining from their face. It's, it's wonderful. Drugs are great. Absolutely wonderful thing to do, um, but some are unsafe enough to be withdrawn. Now, they, they, the, the authors here did a systematic review, 1953 to 2013, and they found that there was recall of uh, 462 pharmaceutical products. Quite a lot, really. Uh, in our current and remarkable period of medical history, direct quote from the article. I like the wording. It's, uh, it's a very nicely written article. Excess mortality figures are high in many countries, often ignored or dismissed by mainstream media news outlets. And there still is excess deaths in very many countries, ignored by mainstream media outlets. And we've said this repeatedly, what is more important than the lives of our people? That's as important as it gets. Why isn't this being reported? Um, this excess mortality may include adverse events caused by novel pharmaceutical agents. If I can pick up my piece of paper. By novel pharmaceutical agents that use gene code technology. Notice they say uh, this may include adverse events. I would say the onus of proof is on those still seeking to... Um, uh, encourage use of these products to say that they're safe. So it may include that. Now, the results from this study. Uh, paralleled with past drug withdrawals, the gene-based vaccines, uh, including distortion of clinical trial data <laughs> with uh, critical adverse events data absent from high-impact journal publications. So evidence that shows things like this uh, is noticeably absent from high-impact journals. Evidence that shows increased deaths in young people. Evidence that shows how readily drugs were withdrawn in the past. Uh, Mer Meridia, uh, recalled in 1997 after 94 deaths. COVID vaccines, not recalled in 2024 after 37,544 deaths, according to VAERS data. Um, why isn't that all over the uh, the medical journals? It should be splashed all over the medical journals, you would have thought, but it isn't. Delayed regulatory action on pharma pharmacovigilance data to trigger marketing withdrawal. So again, here, what, what, what they're saying here is the pharmacovigilance data uh, is not really being acted on in real time by regulatory agencies to trigger a market withdrawal because I would have thought that this data is more than enough to trigger a, a market withdrawal compared to others unless human life is considered more expendable these days I don't know how how, how else do you explain this difference recalls after a few hundred no recalls after tens of thousands um, really quite difficult to explain and of course that's why the authors have written this paper um, um, now, withdrawal occurred after Vivox. This is uh, Roficoxib. R Roficoxib <laughs> was the name of that drug. We we'll go into that later, or maybe in the next video. We'll see how we get on. But uh, this was basically uh, this Rofi, uh, Roficoxib <laughs> was a non-steroid -steroid or uh, anti-inflammatory drug, and it was withdrawn because it was causing heart attacks, basically. So it was withdrawn too slowly. In fact, that's actually the drug itemised uh, there, a Vivox, withdrawn after an appalling amount of deaths, um, withdrawn very late, but nothing like as bad, of course, as the current COVID vaccines, which are still uh, being administered. Uh, and anyway, and these things are apparent with gene-based COVID-19 vaccines. So things like distorted clinical trial data, critical adverse events data not being reported, uh, parallels with uh, gene-based vaccines 
are there, but in the case of the gene-based vaccines, not yet been acted upon. The conclusion of this study, and this is just the the conclusion of the, the abstract really, public health requires access to raw clinical trial data. We must have access to raw clinical trial data. The UK government has this data. The American FDA has this data. Um, the pharmaceutical companies have this data. But the hoi polloi, the common or garden scum like you and me, doesn't have access to this data. Now, fortunately, ordinary people like you and me have brilliant statisticians that will analyse this data for us. Professor Fenton would be analysing it instantly if it was given it. So, so would Dr Craig and other people of Jessica Rose. People of very high calibre would an- analyse this data and we would have real results. But you're not allowed it. It's, it's, it's not for the riffraff like you and me. This, this, is for the, this is for the elites, this data. Can't be sharing data with a hoi polloi. Whatever next. Whatever next. Improved transparency from cooperations and heightened active pharmacovigilance worldwide. So we need the heightened pharmacovigilance and we need the data to be fully shared. Now, um, it then goes on to give lots of other examples. But to tell you the truth, I'm a bit concerned that this video might have, what should we say, distribution difficulties. So I am going to come back and look at the detail. But for now, I'm going to post that as a separate video and we'll see how that goes. So for now, thank you. And uh, thanks to the uh, two doctors, the two Peters, who've written such an excellent study do try and download it for yourself i am going to come back with some more fascinating detail but we'll leave that for now just in case we have problems uh, between me and you i'll leave the rest to your imagination but for now thank you for watching